Welcome, everybody. My name is Mina Jane, and I'm the director of the Ashland Public Library. And I'm really thrilled to be here with Jane O'Neill of, of Culturally Curious, who's going to be talking about the art of the scandal, all about theft and vandals and forgeries. And I hope that you will learn a little bit, as I said just a minute ago, about comeuppance as well. So we're going to hand this over to Jane in just a minute. But I just wanted to say a couple things. One is that we're Always grateful to the Friends of the Ashland Public Library for supporting all of our programming. We couldn't do this stuff without them. And um, I'm also really thrilled to be uh, partnering with both the Ashland Senior Center and the Framingham Public Library for this program because I feel like when we all work together, we can make magic, both libraries and community organizations. So a little bit about Jane. She's hilarious. You're going to enjoy that aspect of her. I have been. <laughs> She's the founder of Culturally Curious, an arts education consulting firm specializing in art appreciation programs. So she's going to tell you a little bit more about your, about her and herself, but I wanted to let you know that you can put questions in the Q&A. You can put chatter in the chat and we'll be, I'll be paying both attention to both, but I think we'll be taking questions at the end of the program. So welcome everybody. Enjoy. Thank you so much, Mina. And thank you everybody for taking time out of your day for, um, for this program to learn a little bit more about some of the most scandalous stories from the history of art. I am always very honored and humbled that uh, that people spend time with me to, to review this material. So thank you again. Um, as Mina said, my name is Jane O'Neill and I own the company Culturally Curious. I have a background in art history and in art education. I have a master's degree in both fields and I've worked at various museums and um, arts nonprofits. I've taught at the college level for more than a decade, but I've been doing this for about the past five years. And really the joy of doing this over Zoom is that you can bring people together from neighboring communities or from, you know, down the eastern seaboard. So um, thank you again to everybody who's joining us from near and far today. So let's uh, get started on our program. I'm going to give you a sense in terms of how we'll spend this next hour together. But, um, but I wanted to give a little bit of a preamble too, because we're going to be talking about these wonderfully fascinating and salacious stories. And as much as possible, I'd like to focus on the art too, because you know it's one thing to hear that, that something was stolen or was attacked or went missing or what have you, but if you don't care about the art, it's sort of like, so what? So we're going to connect the salacious stuff with a little bit of the art appreciation. And I think sort of come away with uh, maybe a deeper understanding and appreciation for the value of these objects that we're looking at. So big picture, we're gonna zoom out for a moment and talk about thefts, vandals, and forgeries, big picture. When we're thinking about art theft, cultural theft, this is like the tale as old as time. It's as old as culture itself. And with these two images, you probably uh, can recognize what I'm about to talk about. On the right over here is the Acropolis in Athens, Greece. This is, you know, these ancient temples from 2000 plus years ago that, um, you know, are, are some of the, the greatest art and architecture known to humanity. And this temple in particular, the Parthenon had this really complicated integrated sculptural program and um, and in particular this triangular pediment over uh, on the top it's sort of crumbling here featured all of these gorgeous sculptures that you see over here on the left they are no longer there they're at the British Museum in London uh, and this was a sale that was negotiated by a Scottish lord named uh, Lord Elgin some people pronounce it Elgin so these are known as the Elgin marbles such a sweet little name for um, some of the best sculptures ever created look at this uh, beautiful wrinkled uh, wet drapery technique in terms of the the, the way the um, cloth sort of sticks to the body here and these sculptures and the uh, remarkable attention to anatomy. But it's, it creates this sort of larger, complex, thorny issue in terms of us thinking about where do, where does work of art, where do works of art really belong? Who owns them? Certainly the people of Greece would say 
they belong here in Athens, if not on the Parthenon, then in specially designed museums that have already been built. But of course, the British Museum says, well, they're already here, we're taking really good care of them, and so many people can access them already. So this is kind of an ongoing issue. Um, once something has been moved, uh, there's this, uh, there's the, the larger uh, concern about repatriation. Now, if we shift our attention to the destruction of artwork, this is uh, a, a, another aspect of humanity that goes back really to the beginning of culture itself. So we know from our own history, our recent history, that as the United States invades other countries, we oftentimes, one of our, one of the first things that we do is to destroy icons and statues of other leaders. That's um, what we did when we invaded Iraq. And we can see that over here um, on the right, that's a photo from 2003. But on the left, what we're looking at is a painting that imagines uh, the Sons of Liberty tearing down a statue of King George III. This would be an image uh, sort of celebrating aspects of, of the American Revolution. And it, it's an imagined image because it was painted decades, <laughs> I, I think more than a half a century later, where we see you know, women are in attendance, the, um, the patriotic Sons of Liberty, e even uh, Native Americans here, but it, when in fact, it, it it was actually slaves that were that were um, kind of forced or tasked to do this. So, um, so what we're seeing here is um, this long tradition of artwork being destroyed. We're going to see it being vandalized and destroyed in in other capacities as well as we move through today's program. And our last kind of big picture idea today is this notion of forgery. Where do you draw the line between copying and forgery? Is it just if you're going to sell something, if you're going to pass something off as um, somebody else's work? What we're looking at here is this remarkable painting. I just love this work so much. It's by the, ar the American artist Samuel F.B. Morse, and it's called Gallery at the Louvre from 1831. And what you can see in this painting is a number of art students sitting in this epic museum studying the works of the old masters, creating their own copies of it. So copying works of art has always been integral to an artist's education. And so it becomes a thorny issue when you really try to pass off somebody's work as your own. You'll you probably recognize some of the works on the wall in the background. We've got some Raphael, some Da Vinci, and some of these artists will be revisiting again during today's program. So <clears throat> Let me give you a sense in terms of how we'll move through the program. This could be, you know, easily like a 12 week long multi um, multi uh, installation series, really, but I've tried to narrow it down with some of the best stories. So we're going to talk about art heists, including the Mona Lisa, um, Hitler's campaigns during World War II and the Gardner Museum. That's a story that's close to home. And then vandalism, we're going to look at um, two old masters and then a recent story, including Banksy, forgery and art fraud, uh, back to Michelangelo again, and, um, and some more recent 20th century uh, uh, fraudulent works and, and um, really incredible artists too. And then we'll wrap things up. So um, over here on the right, we have an image from, I believe it's a silent film where you can see somebody walking off with the Mona Lisa here. It didn't quite happen like that, but we'll talk about it today. All right, so let's get started with Art Heiss and turn our attention to the Mona Lisa. Now, Mona Lisa is painted by Leonardo da Vinci, 1503, without a doubt, the most famous painting in the world. And I think that there's a lot about Leonardo da Vinci that, um, contributed to a lot of the intrigue about the Mona Lisa. He kept this painting with him until 1517. He was clearly attached to it. In fact, I remember when I was uh, much younger, people used to talk about, is this actually a self-portrait of, of Leonardo da Vinci in drag? Because he did say at, some, at one point, um, every portrait is a self-portrait. Da Vinci was 51 years old when he painted <clears throat> 
this famous picture. And, um, and his efforts, really, his work helped to really push the, 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 uh, the movement of the Renaissance into the high Renaissance. I oftentimes think of that happening right around the year 1500. And so this is at that critical point, and he's doing something that's very innovative with this tiny little painting. And I want to show you briefly what makes the Mona Lisa so exceptional for the time and, um, and really in, in, in perpetuity. So what da Vinci starts doing with this portrait that's so different from his contemporaries and his predecessors is that he's not using um, exacting hard edged lines in order to define things like the nose or the lips or the contours of you know the angles of the face. Uh, this is a beautiful portrait by an artist named Lorenzo Costa. This is in my hometown museum um, here in Manchester, New Hampshire. This was painted two years after da Vinci's Mona Lisa. But you can see that the artist is really relying on this kind of linear style, the emphasis on lines in order to portray this woman. With the Mona Lisa, what da Vinci is doing differently is he's using this smudging technique to, to create this kind of sculptural form of her face and of her hands. There aren't any hard edges to anything. So look at the way he's suggested the definition of the nose, the contours of, of the eye sockets here. And that is why people talk about the fascinating Mona Lisa smile. It's not because she's got this little half smile. It's because there are very subtle shadows on either edge of her mouth. Da Vinci was fascinated by anatomy. He, he dissected and studied the muscles of the face. And so he knew exactly how they acted. And he added just a little bit of shading there. Neuroscientists today have studied the way that I perceive the Mona Lisa smile. And when we first glance at her because of that very subtle, subtle shading, we perceive that smile to be more broad than it actually is. That is the secret to her smile. But the secret sauce to, my, to Leonardo da Vinci is that, um, is that he innovated this kind of very subtle shading technique. And that is really why she, um, why she became so important so quickly. So even before this big event that we're going to touch on, um, she was already a very popular um, destination at the Louvre in Paris. Um, people would go and write her love letters and send her flowers. People had a great understanding that this was a significant work of art. But, you know, why all the fuss? <laughs> if you've ever been to the, the Louvre Museum, you've probably stood in this crush of people who are desperately trying to get their own photograph with this tiny little work. It's, um, it's only 21 inches wide. It's, it's really small. But, um, but the reason for it, of course, and the reason why she is the most famous art object on the planet is because because she was stolen. So let's talk a bit about this remarkable art heist. How do you steal the Mona Lisa when she was already pretty darn famous to begin with? And notice 60 detectives seeking her out. This was not, um, the, this was not a, a, a minor story uh, when she disappeared. So the year was 1911. And the way the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre is that somebody who was working there um, literally took her off the wall and walked out of the building with her. <laughs> and as somebody who has worked in, in a number of museums, I can tell you that, um, that museums still have this vulnerability today because artwork is moved and there's very little communication about where things are, where they're going, how long they'll be off you. So people saw the empty, the, the empty place on the wall for, and, and just imagine that somebody else knew what was happening. So it took more than 24 hours before they realized that she was missing. She was stolen by a Louvre Museum employee, um, a, an Italian national who at first sort of felt that it was really important that this Italian masterwork go back to Italy. And, and so, um, so he was really behind this heist, but everyone from JP Morgan to Pablo Picasso himself were targeted as suspects of, of this potential crime here. So, um, 
So a lot of speculation uh, in terms of, of who took what. And just to give you a sense in terms of the gallery that it was hanging in, um, this you can imagine that the tiny little Mona Lisa would have been dwarfed by the enormous paintings in this room. And you might not have you know, run to see her at this point in time. So a little empty uh, space on the wall didn't create a huge cause for concern initially. Now, there was a huge outpouring of emotion once people realized that she was gone. In fact, women in Paris began to powder their faces yellow and try to affect the same kind of um, pose that she has, or that, a little bit of constraint there with, a little, with that little smile. Uh, people uh, really became passionate about the Mona Lisa in a whole new way. So two years after this work of art went missing, um, the, the theft or the thief was discovered because he was trying to sell the work of art. So he was arrested. He was, uh, I believe he was uh, in jail for um, about two years or six months in jail and, and sent back to Italy. <laughs> and, and the work, of course, was restored to the Louvre. It's traveled very rarely since then. It is um, estimated to, I think the last time it traveled, it had a $100 million insurance policy. And I think that was back in, um, in, in the 1960s. So today it would be more than probably $600 million. This is such a valuable work of art. It's the, the numbers are really mind boggling. And since then, um, it's become this sort of target for people because it's such an important symbol in Paris um, that people try to make political statements when, um, when they're at the Louvre. People throw things occasionally at the Mona Lisa. Here, uh, an, a, a curator is indicating some damage that it had suffered. But today, it's behind glass, so bulletproof glass. So you can't get anywhere close to it, no matter what is thrown at it. And, um, and, and, and these days, really, the, the biggest risk that it faces is over cleaning. Um, the famous Mona Lisa, maybe I should back up to another good image of it. The famous Mona Lisa did have eyebrows and she did have eyelashes, but she was over cleaned at one point and that is why they're not there anymore. So really it's the restorers that are the biggest threat to her now. So we're going to turn our attention away from da Vinci to another artist who was in nowhere, nowhere near as successful or as admired as the Italian master. And that artist, <laughs> is Adolf Hitler. Um, I think it's always a surprise for people to remember that Adolf Hitler aspired to be a great artist, especially because we think of artists as being incredibly empathetic, observant, sort of poetic souls. We don't imagine that somebody who is capable of creating something beautiful would also be capable of of, of genocide, it's, it's, they seem really incompatible, but we are looking at two paintings by Adolf Hitler. He especially loved painting architecture. Um, here is a very Aryan version of the Madonna and child over here. But he was, um, as an artist, he was focused on realism, sort of nostalgic works. And of course, as, um, as his political career blossomed, that's probably the wrong word for it. As his political, as he gained more political power, he began to align his cultural ambitions with his artistic ambitions. And so th the way we saw that sort of best come into focus is that Hitler imagined that his small provincial hometown, a little town called Linz in Austria, that that hometown would become this great imperial city with an opera house, parade grounds, hotels, and at the center of the, this kind of fantasy reimagining of his hometown would be his museum, Hitler's fantasy museum that would house close to 30,000 objects and the world's best artwork. Um, where do you get the world's best artwork? Well, for Hitler, that meant you stole it. And um, during, well, really from the beginning of his reign as dictator of Germany, all the way up till the end of his life, those 12 years, he, um, during that time, the Nazis looted approximately 20% of all of the art in Europe. 
It's really hard to wrap your brain around that. And what we're looking at right now is a, a castle in Bavaria, the new Schweinstein Castle. If it looks familiar, it's because it was um, also the inspiration for Walt Disney and the castles that he created at Disneyland and Disney World. But this was a place that the Nazis decided would be a, a great place to house all of this stolen artwork because it wasn't a military target. It wasn't in a strategic location. It would be protected. So you can see here we have um, a, a view inside the Nishwan Weinstein Castle, just one room, the art is stacked two stories high. And this was, this photograph comes from even after the time the Nazis began to empty it out um, because they became uh, sort of fearful that, that this castle would be bombed. So over the course of many months, they began emptying out this castle <laughs> and moving artwork by oxen, by tank, all to an underground salt mine in, um, in, Aus in Austria. This salt mine was about a quarter of a mile below ground and it was still being used as a salt mine. There was just one long single passage to get in and the Nazis transferred close to 7,000 masterwork of paintings into this salt mine um, over the course of several months. Now, in some ways it was a great place to put the, these things because um, they weren't exposed to sunlight and they'd be safe from bombing. And actually the salt kept a uh, pretty steady humidity in the space as well. The Nazis, as you can see, built all the storage for these artworks. They even built curators offices and rooms to help uh, to, to, uh, for restorers to work on these paintings that had suffered some damage uh, during the movement. So inside the space, I want to show you a few, uh, just a few of the works that were found there and give you a sense for what we could have lost had um, had this salt mine been blown up as the Nazis actually intended to do at a certain point. One of the works that was discovered in that mine is known as the Ghent altarpiece and it dates to the early 1400s. It was painted by two brothers, Jan and Hubert van Eyck. And what we're looking at is um, it's, a, it's an altarpiece. So it sort of opens and closes like the shutters of a window. And an altarpiece like this would have been in a church or cathedral setting, and it would have been closed most of the time. So this is what the average person would see most days when they went to church. So we've got a depiction of the Annunciation, the angel Gabriel coming to Mary and telling her that she's divinely pregnant. And we've got the patrons, the people who would have helped to finance something like this, kneeling down below. Now, this is a gorgeous painting, but, um, but it really knocks your socks off when you open it up. I didn't mention either that it's 12 feet tall. So just the scale of it is really impressive. So you can see um, these, these people down below are just starting to open it. And when it's wide open, it's knock your socks off technicolor. It's absolutely gorgeous. Now, can you imagine living in the early 1400s? Everything is drudgery. <laughs> Everything is hard. Everything's difficult. There's certainly no HBO. <laughs> There's nothing beautiful to feast your eyes on. I would be at church every single day if I could come and look at something like this. So let's kind of zoom in here. Ooh. Before I do that, I just wanted to give you a quick sort of preamble in terms of what we're looking at. Um, we've got obviously a number of different panels here. Right at the center, we have an image not of Jesus. This is a sort of unusual um, uh, organization of images. This is actually God the Father right at the center of, of the, the, the image. And then we have Adam and Eve on the edges. And then um, down below, we'll see um, a symbolic depiction of Jesus. So the idea is creation, the fall of man, and then redemption, all in this one big um, painting, uh, in this one big altarpiece. So I wanted to zoom in on the face of God here. <laughs> because he's roughly life-size. And as you can see, the artist spared no detail when it came to rendering um, the, the, minu the minutia of these figures. We see every pearl, every gem is glistening. You can see individual hairs on his head. My eye always goes to what I think is just one white hair in his beard. So there's such 
fine detail in this painting that we know that the Van Eyck brothers were using paintbrushes that would have a single hair on them. It's really just stunning. So as, as we go back to the work itself, uh, I just want to draw your attention to the fact that we just saw God the Father. He's wearing the triple crown of heaven here, but he has an, an earthly uh, crown at his feet. Just another detail of all of the riches that they include in, in this painting. Um, the fact that, that God's robe is, is encrusted with these, um, with these pearls and everything shimmers, shines, and dazzles, doesn't it? So as we zoom out one last time, I wanted to draw your attention down here to this remarkable panel. And this would be sort of the emphasis of what most people could see. This would, the way it is displayed, this would be right at eye level. And as we zoom in here, we can see literally scores of individual figures here. And you know, some of these are portraits, um, recognizable individuals who are all coming to pray at, um, at this symbolic uh, sort of retelling of the crucifixion of Jesus and more figures in the back, this group of women coming in from the right. There's such an attention to detail that you can actually read the texts that are open over here. So um, as we zoom in just one last time, you can see that um, the mystical lamb, as this is known as, uh, contains all these references to Jesus. He's leading into um, this chalice. There's a cross in the background. So, um, so that emphasis on, on redemption would have been so important, especially to that audience in, in the 1400s. What a powerful work of art. Now, um, this was an ideal find for, for Hitler and, um, and for his planned museum. So this was a work that even though um, this, the city of Ghent was trying to hide it, they actually got it out of town. It was intercepted by the Nazis and then eventually brought down into that salt mine. These are um, some of the members of the Monuments Men, famous from the book and the movie, who discovered just that panel of the mystical lamb. Look at how damaged it is down there in the salt mine. And I think I have just a few more images of them um, examining these works before um, ultimately restoring them um, back to their proper owner. So today the Ghent altarpiece is back in the cathedral in Ghent and it is now enclosed in um, some sort of uh, incredible case that cost about 30 million euro. I don't think it will ever be stolen again. So we'll wrap up uh, this section uh, with the probably the most familiar, at least the, 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 the art theft that's closest to home uh, from the Gardner Museum in Boston. Now, this is one, this is a story that is uh, particularly close to me because um, when I lived in Boston, I was a tour guide at the Gardner Museum and I worked there for a number of years as well. So here is an early view of the Gardner Museum, which Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, Isabella Stewart Gardner uh, sort of co designed with her architect to look like a Venetian palazzo. So it was perfectly sited on the fens um, in this kind of marshy ground, just like Venice, the, the city that she loved so much. And of course, it's been all developed all around it. Um, so it doesn't look like this today. And if you've been there before, you know, that the courtyard of the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum is one of the most spectacular places in all of New England, if not all of America. You walk in there and it always feels like spring, even if it's like the grayest, uh, grimiest day outside of Boston. She, um, she, she, Isabella Stewart Gardner actually got up on a ladder and began sort of sponging paint onto the wall. She wanted the effect inside this, this courtyard to look like water, the, the reflection of light shimmering off of the water in, um, in Venice. And today, this garden is, is filled with these incredible plants, these rare plants. I think that the best job at the Gardner Museum would be uh, the chief horticulturist because they can um, update and move things around. And we'll learn very quickly that 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 you can't do that with the rest of the museum. So I do also, before we move away from this image, just want to point out that one of the um, 
One of the genius elements of Isabella Stewart Gardner and her installation of her collection is that she had a great sense for when things didn't even necessarily match or come from the same spot, she could arrange them in ways that, that um, unified them and harmon harmonize them. So you can see um, that all of these architectural elements, these window frames and, and um, balustrades come from different buildings, come from different palaces in Venice. Some of them have a pointed uh, Gothic art some of them have the OG arch over here. And, um, and she found a, an interesting and intriguing way to install them here. Brings up the issue of don't these architectural elements belong in Venice, but we'll set that aside for now. She installed her collection in, um, in the same way that she saw works of art installed in the museum, the Pitti Palace in Florence. She loved the integration of uh, furniture and decorative arts and fine art together. This is a view of her um, Raphael room with her two Raphael paintings situated right by the window for the best light, but of course that uh, ultimately degrades them as as well. We're looking at her um, stained glass gothic window over here uh, in her consecrated chapel in the museum where every year, according to her will, they still have to hold services for her. And then, um, and then really the last stop in her museum, if you're just sort of moving through organically, is the gothic room. And the last stop is really this portrait of Isabella Stewart Gardner by the artist John Singer Sargent from 1888, where, um, where it sort of seems like she's presenting herself a little bit like a a Byzantine Madonna with a little uh, the suggestion of a halo and a crown as she stands here um, with these sort of sadly empty arms. She's a, a woman who lost a, a, a child in infancy. And I think that always uh, had an impact on her. But creating this museum was something that, um, that fulfilled her life. And it meant so much to her that according to her will, Nothing in the museum could ever be moved, changed, bought, or sold. Otherwise, the entire collection would be dismantled, shipped to Paris, auctioned off, and all the money would go to Harvard. So everything was just as she left it in 1924 when she died, up until 1999, <laughs> when two men dressed as Boston City police officers went to the back door slash staff entrance of the museum in the middle of the night and um, rounded up the two guards that were working there, tied them up, as you can see with uh, this, this image of one of those guards, even used duct tape to, um, to restrain him. And then they spent about the next 90 minutes moving through the museum, um, seemingly uh, checking off sort of like a, a shopping list of, of specific objects that they that they wanted. And um, sort of knowing that without the guards uh, to worry about, they had kind of all the time in the world to do this. I always thought of this as like a gentleman's crime, but when you see the crime scene photographs, you realize that there was nothing elegant about this. They were smashing frames, they were cutting paintings right out of their frames. Um, it was, it, it was a little bit of a smash and grab, but they took a long time doing it. And what a loss for the museum, for the city of Boston. This is the Dutch room at the Gardner Museum. You can see uh, it's missing three major works here. So let's turn our attention to some of the paintings that are no longer there. There are two, uh, the two large uh, empty frames in the background here. Those were both paintings by Rembrandt that nobody has seen since 1990, um, at least nobody outside of organized crime. Um, so we have a portrait of a couple. I love this picture because whenever I see this sort of somber looking couple dressed all in black, I'm reminded that Rembrandt was working at the time, the exact same time that people were coming to America, the pilgrims were coming to America, and they look as somberly dressed as pilgrims. But in fact, you had to be very wealthy to have black clothes that um, it, it, it took so much uh, uh, dye in order to dye your clothes black that, that that this was actually a pretty ostentatious display of wealth for the time, as was this, this starched collar here. So this is a, a wealthy couple. We know from x-rays that they had a child who was included in this portrait who was later painted out because um, that child um, died when he was very young. Over here on the right, we have a, a, a Rembrandt's depiction of Christ on the Sea of Galilee. This dates to about 1630. And, um, and what we see here in this uh, in this picture is like 
classic um, Baroque painting. Everything during the Baroque is really about drama, about dynamism. And so we have this boat that is at almost this uh, perfect diagonal in the painting, cutting it in half this way into these two triangles. We've got light, we've got dramatic shadow, we've got the drama of the waves here. And we have all of these figures in the boat, some of them sort of struggling to write the boat. Some of them are listening to Christ as he preaches. Now we'll zoom in for a mo moment to appreciate really the individuality of these figures. Notice that Rembrandt even included somebody who was getting sick over the edge of the boat here. And he also included a self-portrait. Rembrandt loved to paint his self-portraits. He was like the king of selfies before cameras were invented. So, and he's even breaking the fourth wall here. He's looking out at us and inviting us to engage with this work of art. Uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner owned multiple Rembrandt self-portraits. Here is an etching that was about a, an inch, maybe two inches high. It was in a frame that was screwed to um, a piece of furniture inside the museum. And the, the, the robbers uh, were so interested in this self-portrait that they even took the time to unscrew that frame and take off with this tiny little self-portrait. They also were interested in works uh, that came after the Dutch Baroque. These are two French Impressionist works by um, Manet and Degas. They also took strange works, including an ancient Chinese beaker, one of the oldest objects in the collection, dates back to about 12,000 BC. And just the top, just the finial of this Napoleonic flag was something else that they made off with. But um, by far the most valuable object that they took that night was this painting by another Dutch Baroque master, the artist Vermeer. This is the concert, it was painted in 1664. And what we're looking at is a composition that's very similar to um, many of Vermeer's compositions. It's an interior space. There's light coming in from a window on the left. In this case, you can't see the window, but we've got this beautiful light and shadow in this space, a great sense of depth because of the tiles on the floor. And we see a woman um, playing what is sort of similar to a harpsichord. You can see that it's open over here. Uh, a, a, a man with his back to us who is um, holding a stringed instrument and then a, a third figure a woman who's standing and she has a uh, um music in her hand and her other free hand is sort of conjuring the sound, conjuring the breath from her chest as she is accompanying these two musicians by singing. It's a beautiful picture. We've got the gorgeous detail, of the, like the rug hanging over this table, the details of their costumes, and even the fact that there's additional images on the back wall and inside this harpsichord. It's just rich with information. And um, sometimes this information tells us a little bit more about the, the, the story um, than would be expected. It's not an accident that we have uh, three sort of amorous figures back here <laughs> in this picture on the right. It's supposed to suggest a sort of amorous connection between the three figures in this group. So they're making music together, but they are literally in accord too. Now I should mention that Vermeer um, only painted about 35, 36 canvases during his entire Higher career. So this is incredibly rare. And um, let's just put it this way, Vermeers don't often come up for auction. So, um, so it's quite a loss for, um, for the art community and beyond. And just a quick reminder, this is still an open case with the FBI. If you know anything about it, please come forward and you'll get $10 million in exchange. As we wrap up our, um, our look at art theft, our next sections are much shorter. I just wanted to note that this still happens throughout the world all the time. Some museums get robbed in the middle of the day and they get robbed repeatedly. This is, um, I believe, a photo of some um, art thieves robbing the Munch Museum in Oslo, Norway. Um, that, that museum has gotten robbed several times. So let's turn our attention now to another really sort of salacious subject in the, um, in the art world, and that is art attacks. Um, when people 
um, uh, seek to destroy works of art or damage them. Um, it's implied violence, really. I mean, if you had a photograph of someone you didn't like it and you tore it up, that's that's implied violence too. When we destroy an image, we're destroying more than just an, the image. And so, um, so there's oftentimes sort of this shared horror at the purpose, purposeful destruction of a work of art. So we're going to start um, this section in, um, in Italy at the Vatican. Maybe some of you have visited the Vatican before the largest church in Christendom. And you might remember walking through, walking up these steps and through these grand uh, doors. And one of the first things you see on your right is Michelangelo's absolutely sublime sculpture, the Pieta. He was about 23 years old when he carved it. It dates to 1499. And, um, and what makes this sculpture so incredible? Well, Michelangelo finds this incredible balance in it. He has balanced male and female, horizontal and vertical, nude and clothed. But what he's doing here is presenting a whole new way of showing us Christ, the dead Christ in his mother's arm. It's a form that has been around for centuries and oftentimes artists have used it as an opportunity to emphasize Christ's wounds and his suffering. Um, they show his body looking emaciated, looking pained, looking um, distorted, disgusting. But with Michelangelo, he made Christ absolutely gorgeous. He, he made Mary absolutely perfect. Their divinity is rooted in this um, physical beauty that Michelangelo was able to capture. So this really is one of the most prized, most revered works of art in Christianity. Well, all of this <laughs> um, intersects with the story of this young man named Laszlo Toth. Um, he was a Hungarian-born Australian geologist, and in the early 1970s, he moved to Italy, and he was kind of walking around telling people at first that he was Michelangelo, and then later on that he was Jesus himself. One day in 1972, he walks into the Vatican with one of his geologist hammers and is able to take 12, somewhere between 12 and 15 wax at the Pieta. And you can see here that he, um, that he even manages to sever her arm. Just very briefly going back to that arm, you can see that gesture right there is just so powerful. It's like she's offering her son up and also maybe at the same time, even questioning why she has to lose her son. And then that arm is gone. This is such a remarkable photograph here because we can see him being captured in the middle of the photograph and the struggle that ensued. So you might be thinking, okay, well, I, I, I've seen the Pieta. I don't remember that it was damaged, um, but it was severely damaged, especially the, the Virgin's face here. He took off part of her nose, her eyelids, her hands. Um, it was a, a, a stunning sort of loss for, uh, for the art world, really, uh, because of what he did to her. You can see that the veil was damaged as well. Now, the reason you don't remember seeing the Pieta damaged is because, remarkably, the, um, the Vatican had taken a, a, a mold of this sculpture uh, in the years prior. So we, we were able to perfectly restore it because we knew exactly the contours of every element of this sculpture. I think probably they did this in advance of the sculpture coming to America for the World's Fair, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, in the end, uh, the hundreds of fragments that um, that Laszlo Toth's uh, um, attack uh, sort of dispersed uh, were able to be reformed here. Even Some people even took little pieces of it as souvenirs and, and left the Vatican with it. So today that sculpture is behind uh, bulletproof glass. So we can't get as close to it as before. Oops, sorry. Um, but we can certainly still appreciate it um, and millions do. We're going to turn our attention now to, uh, I, would, I would call this the, the Louvre of the Netherlands. We're going to go to the Rijksmuseum 
Museum, um, which maybe some of you have visited before. This is on my bucket list. And the must-see painting when you're at the Rijks Museum is Rembrandt's masterwork known as the Night Watch. It dates to 1642. And it's called the Night Watch because it's this sort of dark painting here, but it's actually, it's actually a daytime scene. And the picture itself was just uh, varnished so much over the years that it looks like a nighttime scene. What we're looking at is, um, is a portrait really of a militia group and militia por portraits were very popular at the time. Usually they were like school picture day in terms of how they were organized. Everybody in the militia would pay the artist and they'd all line up and everybody's faces would be seen um, perfectly. But Rembrandt wanted to tell a story. Rembrandt wanted to convey a militia in an entirely different way. So he shows the militia sort of um, gathering up uh, their arms and sort of springing into action. It, he, he makes what should be or what has typically been kind of a boring portrait session into a grand historical painting. And it's filled with these wonderful historical inaccuracies in terms of the weapons and the helmets and all of this, because Rembrandt was just giving them random stuff from his studio to wear. Um, it's also filled with strange details that nobody has ever really been able to decode. My favorite of them being this little golden girl in the middle ground. If you have really good eyes, she has a dead chicken hanging upside down from her waist. Um, we don't know why. <laughs> and there's a lot of details like that within Rembrandt's Night Watch. So this is um, such an important painting to the museum and such an important symbol to the Netherlands that it has been the subject of a number of attacks over the years. And it's usually people who are unstable to begin with, who also want to kind of lash out at the state in general. So over here, we see some slashes. Um, it has been attacked with knives over the years. I think uh, one point, it's oftentimes people who are unemployed, um, an unemployed educator, I think, and an unemployed bread maker have attacked it on different uh, occasions. And, um, and it has even been sprayed with acid at one point. And in, remarkably, the guards knew exactly what to do and had um, the necessary tools on hand in order to neutralize that acid. So all of this means that when you rush into the, the Ranks Museum and you go crowd around this picture to see it, that, that it is there and it still looks absolutely gorgeous. And um, in recent years, they restored this painting once again. And it's so popular that they decided to build uh, basically a restoration studio around the painting right there in the gallery. And they live streamed the restoration as well. So you could get really up close and personal with each element. And now you can really really see those uh those chicken feet hanging off of that golden girl. <laughs> so the last um, art uh, van uh, example of art vandalism that I wanted to share with you is um, is a much more recent example. And it relates to the anonymous graffiti artist known as Banksy. He is um, English, uh, England based. Uh, he's a political activist and his, his tags really have, have shown up all over the world. And Banksy is an artist that um, doesn't really like <laughs> the art, the fine art industry in general. Um, here's one of his tags. This will look nice when it's framed. Uh, he is creating these works to make a statement a lot of the times. And in recent years, because a lot of celebrities wanted to collect his works of art, uh, the value of his work has just skyrocketed so that he could um, graffiti on the side of a building and increase property values in the area because he tagged there. Um, there's such a demand for his work that he created this company he called Pest Control to authenticate his work. You can imagine some people would, you know, fake a Banksy in order to, to um, raise their property values. So he created Pest Control, which I think says a lot about how he feels about the art world. And, and they are charged with saying, this is an authentic Banksy, this is not. Now, one of Banksy's best known works is The Girl with the Balloon, where we see um, 
a spray painted uh, sort of stenciled girl here um, who seems like she's standing in the wind and she has just released or sort of lost her grip on a red balloon that's in the shape of a heart. And we all know that feeling of when you're a child and you lose your helium balloon and it begins to fly away. It's just that sinking loss, that kind of devastation. And in this case, because it's a heart-shaped balloon, we can sort of expand upon that too. It's like losing love in some ways. So it's a simple but really powerful image. And it's um, it first appeared around London as graffiti art about 20 years ago and has since appeared around the world. And so occasionally uh, Banksy will create this, this work of art or recreate it on paper and on canvas, have it authenticated and then auction it off. And that is exactly what was happening um, just a few years ago. Um, I believe it was 2018 when this work was auctioned off at Sotheby's and it sold for $1.3 million. And the second the gavel dropped, as you can see from the shocked faces here, the painting began to shred itself within the frame. So you can see it sort of sliding out of the frame and you can see these thin slices here and everybody is just sort of mortified to see that, that somebody just spent more than a million dollars on something that is now uh, essentially garbage, right? Now Sotheby seized on this moment. They said, this is the first time in, in, in the history of our company that you know a new work of art was created live during one of our auctions. And actually Banksy uh, himself said, yes, this is an entirely new work of art and I intended to do this. You can see that the frame itself has this um, sort of significant structure to it. Banksy later released um, images of the back of this frame that had the, um, the shredder embedded in it and even how he tested it because he did intend to shred this picture from the beginning. So now pest control says that this is a whole new work of art <laughs> and the new title is called Love is in the Bin. And I think that the person who spent more than a million dollars on it is thrilled to have a new original and a very famous one at that, but from Banksy. So we'll wrap up in our last 10 minutes here with uh, a few few stories about art frauds. Um, and Banksy is actually going to be our transition here because one of the most famous uh, quotes in, in the history of art is the bad artists imitate the great artist steal that's often attributed to Pablo Picasso. Banksy says, no, 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 I'll just take that, one, that quote for myself as well. So it's interesting to think about how um, a little bit of fraud, <laughs> a little bit of copying can sometimes launch someone's career and in some cases kind of halt someone's career. So the, I'm going to begin with two stories about very well-known artists. And the first is Michelangelo. We're looking at a portrait of him from um, when he was roughly 60 years old. We don't have any images of him when he was a young man, but he was by all accounts just a prodigy when it came to sculpture as a young man. And one of the ways he, <clears throat> he sort of chose to prove himself was to create an image, a sculpted image of a sleeping Cupid or a sleeping Eros, like the one that you see over here on the right. This isn't the actual sleeping Cupid because nobody knows where that is. This is a, um, a, 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 a similar one that's in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, Michelangelo was really trying to create something that looked like it was from classical antiquity, make it look like it was something 1500 years old. So not only did he sculpt it that way, and it was very, um, very deceptive, but he even added chemicals to the stone to make it look old, to make it look like it was something that was just, you know, dug out of the ground in a recent excavation. And he fooled everybody. And when it was revealed that he had, he had fooled them, that he had tricked them, um, that he had this remarkable talent, it, um, people weren't angry with him. It, in fact, they celebrated this remarkable talent that could um, fool so many art lovers. So this helped to really catapult his career and get him a really significant commissions in, um, in the next few years, including the Pieta that we just looked at. So in his case, a little bit of art fraud went a long way. Uh, I wouldn't say the same is true for the artist Salvador Dali, the great showman Salvador Dali 
Hurley, who we see over here in the photograph on the left with his, um, <laughs> with his uh, famous mustache over here too. So he is one of the leading members of the surrealist movement from the 1920s and 30s. We can see his most famous work, The Persistence of Memory from 1931 over here on the right. Um, you know, the famous melting clocks, the sort of anamorphic face that we see over here with the eyelashes, and maybe that's a nose or a tongue sticking out underneath it. Um, his fixation on things like rotting and decaying. So we've got the bugs and the ants congregating on the watches over here. Now he made such a name for himself. He was such a sensational figure. And he created this whole iconography that people were always kind of fascinated by his, um, his paintings look like lucid dreams, or in some cases like nightmares. But he sort of shot himself in the foot a little bit later on in his career, decades later in his career, because he sort of defied um, what is acceptable in terms of uh, a master and apprentice relationship. Uh, at one point, uh, it was discovered that Salvador Dali had simply signed um, hundreds, if not thousands of, of blank sheets of paper. And then he was letting his students, his apprentices, fill in these sheets of paper with elements of his, uh, you know, famous iconography, the melting watches and what have you. Um, doing this is sort of outside of the bounds in terms of the art world, because ma masters are supposed to review works of art and then add their signatures to them um, or create the works of art themselves. So simply just signing blank papers and saying you make a work of art was considered pretty fraudulent. And, um, and I think it, this is sort of a lesser known story in the art world because um, I was recently in a a very lovely house of, you know, multi-million dollar house that had a lot of Salvador Dali prints on the wall. And unfortunately, I mean, you just can't authenticate them anymore. You don't really know what you're getting when you buy Salvador Dali um, artwork, especially works on paper. So he, um, he had th this little bit of fraud in this case, I think sort of, uh, sort of tarnished his reputation um, uh, from then on. To, to a certain degree. So we'll turn our attention now to a few people who made a career really at copying works of art. And the gentleman that we're looking at here in the center is a man by the name of John Myatt. And you can see that he is standing next to his painting of Vincent van Gogh's famous self-portrait from the Musée d'Orsay, uh, almost exact replica of the object in the museum. Now, John Myatt was a man who just kind of stumbled into art forgery. He had this particular talent to create exact replicas. And, um, and he wanted to spend more time with his kids. So he was basically at home bumming around and did a little painting on the side and then advertised in a private eye magazine, like a, a trade magazine for private detectives that he had this talent. Well, <laughs> that kind of fell into the wrong hands because a man by the name of John Drew saw John Myatt's um, capabilities and began buying works of art from John Myatt, um, creating forged documents to authenticate them. And then he was selling them off as originals. Uh, eventually, John Drew and John Myatt began to partner and, um, and create works of art that would then enter the art market or even sometimes even into museum collections um, so that they could both benefit from it. When all was said and done, I believe they, um, they had about a 25 million euro uh, business <laughs> based on this forged artwork. <coughs> And after they were apprehended, John Drew uh, was sentenced to uh, two years, or he served two years in prison, and John Myatt ser served six months in prison. He makes a name for himself now as the person who makes authentic fakes. So you can buy something that might look like the girl with the pearl earring, but you know that it's that you're not getting the girl with the pearl earring. So he's you know developed a celebrity around. Um, 
this notorious behavior that he, that he engaged in. So, um, so at least he's come clean and he's got, you know, a straight and honest life now. We'll wrap up with one last famous forger here, and his name is Elmer Dohori. And, um, and he was a, a forger who created at least a thousand uh, fake artworks during the course of his life. His life story is fascinating. He, as a young man, he was in a, a German concentration camp during World War II, and then he was essentially like a starving artist in Paris following the war. And he realized he could dash off these little drawings and pass them off as Picasso and he could sell them to tourists. And then he realized he could even sell them to galleries. And he, like John Myatt, would occasionally have um, a business partner who would help to um, sell works, help to provide some authentication for them. But in the end, his business partners were always trying to scam him. Um, but during this time, Amir Dahori um, was able to uh, generate about $50 million in sales um, in today's money in terms of, uh, of uh, the, the forged artworks that he was uh, able to create and sell. Now, just to give you a sense in terms of what he was doing, his focus was really to create works in the style of famous artists and usually modern masters. So we've got a real Picasso line drawing over here and Elmir Dahori over on the right. And I will say, he never signed his works. He never did a fake signature. So that would sort of get him out of this um, thorny issue of, of these works being absolute frauds. <laughs> he created fake Modigliani's, an original over here, an Elmir de Ori over here. Um, some of these works do have his actual signature on them. Um, these were works that he wasn't passing off as, as Modigliani. And then we have a, a real Moti Matisse on the left and a, a forgery on the right. And it was actually a forged Matisse that helped to get him caught. He sold it to um, a museum at Harvard, actually. And they were so pleased with it that he offered them a few more works by other artists. And there was a very smart curator there that sort of said, okay, these works are all supposed to be by different artists, but they look like they're all done by the same person. And that helped to get him caught. Uh, so essentially over 30 years, he's uh, created all of these forgeries. He says some of them are hanging in museums today. Um, and so this kind of work obviously raises all these questions about um, authenticity of art objects throughout the art market, uh, uh, creates a lot of skepticism and doubt for sure. So let's turn our attention now to just wrapping up <laughs> some of the big ideas once again. So we've talked a little bit about, um, about authentic objects and where they belong. What is the true home for an object, whether it's at the Parthenon or in that empty frame at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. Um, but as we think about this, this idea of the true home for a work of art, it brings up the notion that the original work of art has such tremendous value to us, even in, um, even in today's society where we can quickly make copies of things. When we look at and consider um, examples of, of the destruction of works of art, it reminds us in terms of how an act like this has these kind of rippling effects, whether they're in politics or religion or just in the art world itself. These are um, really monuments to our, our shared history, our, our civilization. And to destroy something like that is, is um, is, well, obviously it's not just symbolic violence, it is, it's, it's violence in and of itself. And, and, it, and it, it says a lot about who we are and, and how we value these things that, that, we, that we're shocked by it, that we're moved by it. So finally, we're reminded as we <laughs> reflect on today's program, that imitation is always the most sincere form of flattery. Back to um, John Myatt here with his original fakes, uh, self-portrait in the style of Picasso. In the end, we are drawn to the original object, the, um, the idea of creative inspiration, the light bulb going off, um, the, the objects that are made by the hand of the master. These are the kinds of objects that will continue to intrigue us for years to come. So I will end there for now. And I welcome any questions or comments you might have. I'll start looking at the chat and the Q&A as well. Oh, um, Jane, I can, um, yep. do you want me to read some questions sure. to you or do you want to go ahead and? 
Okay, so oh. Laura asks, uh, you mentioned purposeful destruction of art, but what about destruction that isn't necessarily purposeful? She's thinking about infamous repainting of the Ecce Homo as a, yes. an example, but also older approaches to archaeology reconstruction, such as the 1920s reconstruction of the Palace of Minos and its mosaics. Oh, Laura, what an interesting comment. I, that's, it's sort of par that's like a parallel issue um, with some overlap there too. Um, the, the repainting of the Ecce Homo, I think has become a meme. It's probably something that we've seen, that everybody has seen, even if they can't necessarily recall it at this point. But um, a well-intentioned person was trying to restore work of art and then it became like this grotesque <laughs> repainting of, of, of the original. But um, but yeah, I mean, that sort of points to this idea that even as we try to, um, to restore and maintain things that we kind of hold sacred, sacred in our culture, we, if, um, if it's not done properly, it really can destroy a work of art. Even like Mona Lisa and her eyelashes and eyebrows, I would say falls into that category too. So, um, so I, I feel like without the evil intention there, I think we can, you know, uh, kind of uh, sort of separate it out from somebody, you know, taking a hammer to the PA top. But I, it, those things are related. And, and it points to, you know, just how fragile these things are and, um, and, and what incredible work is involved with preserving them and how important these museums actually are for housing them and making sure they're safe. So I'm glad you pointed that out. It is a related kind of parallel thread there. Mm -hmm. And I see Renee is asking about the Reichs Museum. Oh, you were there after it was slashed. Oh, so you weren't able to see. It. Well, now you have to go back, Renee. Uh, <laughs> well, hopefully it's not slashed anymore at all. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now I think it's looking better than ever. But it, I mean, that also brings up the, the bigger issues. Like sometimes these paintings are more, res more restoration than the painting itself. Um, there was a famous uh, Da Vinci purportedly Da Vinci painting that sold for $450 million. And generally speaking, every Da Vinci scholar said, if Da Vinci painted this, it's been so heavily restored that it's more uh, the hand of the restorers than Da Vinci himself. So um, at least we know that the Night Watch is mostly Rembrandt still. <laughs> um, and then uh, Deborah asked, do you have any thoughts on the destruction of the Confederacy statues? Even though they represent intolerance, the statues are heroic. Do you think this is remaking history? Well, I can share with you my personal perspective on this. And, um, and uh, you know, everybody's entitled to their personal perspective. Um, my thought is that A, most people learn about art in museum settings, not through public sculpture. So we don't necessarily learn about our history through public sculpture. And, and I think oftentimes when it's something as complicated as, as, um, as a celebratory image of somebody who endorsed slavery, uh, I think that really needs to be more of a discussion than something that necessarily needs to be in a town square. So I think a lot of those sculptures that were taken down, I think there was an intention to have it maybe housed in a museum or something like that, as opposed to just being torn down. There was even a sculpture in Boston, um, the Friedman sculpture by Thomas Ball. It was, um, it was a copy of, of a work that was originally in, in Washington, DC. And it was just, um, the, the portrayal of the African-American in that sculpture was just questionable enough that the city of Boston thought, let's take this down, put it in a different setting where you can have a real conversation about what's going on in, the, in, in this work, as opposed to propping it up and saying, this represents us as a culture as we are today. So, um, so that's my personal take on it, but, um, but obviously everybody's, everybody's entitled to their opinion there. So, um, what about the woman in gold movie and the story yeah. of that stolen art? Yes, I need, I still need to see that movie. I, I, I'm glad that somebody um, brought it up. If you're not familiar with it, I believe 
fits uh, Helen Mirren and Ryan Reynolds. And it is the story of the restitution of this incredible painting called The Woman in Gold. It's painted by Gustav Klimt. It's the portrait of Adele Blockbauer from about 1907. And the Nazis had stolen this painting in 1941 and put it in a museum. And so the descendant of the, of the man that commissioned the work of art um, uh, engaged in like a seven year long legal battle Battle that went all the way to the Supreme Court um, in order to kind of win back this painting. And I, I, well, I won't give any spoiler alerts, but it's a really incredible story. So, um, so if you're interested in, you know, anything that relates back to, you know, the Nazis and art that was stolen, I, I highly recommend learning more about that portrait or watching the movie, although mm -hmm. I've never seen the movie. <laughs> <laughs> there are a couple things in the chat, if you have a few more minutes. Sure. Um, Kathy says the paintings of, um, oh my gosh, the Mona Lisa seems larger than when she saw it last. Is is that because of the framing or? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I'm not I'm not necessarily sure, but it might be. It, yeah, it is sort of like set off in. Um, let's see, going all the way back, just to give you a whiplash. It is sort of set in set, I think, and maybe that could be part of it but I'm not necessarily sure. Let's just look at that. Um, maybe part of it could be the way it's inset there, but I think it's only about 30 inches high by 21 inches. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's tiny, really. <laughs> I think for a lot of people, you know, they run through the loo looking for it and then they get to it and they're just like, this little thing, this is all the fuss. <laughs> So Joyce asks, how do museum and auction houses, uh, how, uh, authenticators do their job? Is it like in the movies where they paint as carbon dated? Oh, that is really good question. That is not my area of expertise, I will admit. Um, so, so I think I, I, I'm, I'm sure that all of, all of the processes are rooted in, um, in science and, um, and, I, I, I apologize, I can't go further into it because I really don't know the science around it, but that's, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, so Joan has a comment for several years, she lived in Rome near the Villa Giulio and an Etruscan museum. She remembers being told that most of the collection at that time was fake. I think that the museum has been completely revamped and art historians have authenticated the work there, which is nice. Oh, I guess. Very, yeah. <laughs> it, well, it's interesting because even in Boston at the MFA, when the MFA was first founded, believe it or not, it was just filled with plaster casts of, um, of like famous sculptures. Mm -hmm. So even our sense in terms of what's important enough to display um, has really changed over time. And of course, these days, we wouldn't think of putting a plaster cast of, of, of like a famous sculpture in a museum. We want the original, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm sure for in terms of preservation, too, they, they just thought, okay, let's just make some copies of these things and make sure the original is protected. But it, it seems to be kind of an evolving issue. Um, and we as, as a culture uh, sort of are moving along in terms of, of how, we, how we think about the original versus the copy. So I think we're just about out of questions, but I did want to ask one last one of my own, yeah. which is about, um, you had said some museums get uh, robbed very frequently or at least multiple yeah. times. Is that just because of their security or because of the artwork that they have? Both. Um, so like the like I mentioned, the, uh, we had the image of the Munch Museum being robbed. Um, part of it is that Munch paintings are, are recognizable, they're, they're highly valued. Um, but the other part of it is that just because a museum is robbed doesn't mean that it gets any additional funding for security. Mm -hmm. So if they don't beef it up, it's, it's like a, it's just like a target with a neon sign on it, unfortunately. It's like an easy mark. And I think we think, oh, well, once the work is restored, it's like nobody's going to touch it again. And that's certainly how a lot of museums think, too. They're, they think that lightning doesn't strike twice, but thieves will go back. <laughs> pretty crazy, isn't it? It is. Um, I know people in the comments and chats have been talking about the, their own experience with the art yeah. and um, what they've seen and what they feel about mm -hmm. it. So that's really nice. Um, I really appreciate all of that. Um, let's see, Marie says, the theft at the Paris Musée Marmont was in broad daylight and was solved eventually by a woman detective. Ooh. 
I'm awesome. going to have to look into that. That's really <laughs> interesting. I know. Well, thank you, Jane, so much for your time. This has been fascinating and interesting. And um, I feel like I need to do some uh, research of my own just to follow right. up on some of these things. Because now I have some <laughs> many questions. <laughs> Right, right. Well, thank you again, everybody for spending your afternoon with me. And I hope you enjoyed it and learned a little bit. Um, so thank you. And thank you, Mina. Oh, you're welcome. Have a great day, everybody. And I hope to see you again soon. Take Bye. Care. Bye.